Hey everybody, it's Cheryl Lawson and welcome to Live FAQ and LiveFAQ.com. I'm here today with Dr. Craig Brandman, who is a cardiologist from Palo Alto, California, and he's the co-founder of Step One Health and StepOneHealth.com. So welcome, Dr. Brandman. Hi, Cheryl. How are you today? Oh, wonderful. So, uh, Dr. Brandman has been, I always want to call you Dr. Craig, so if I do that, I, <laughs> I apologize in advance. Uh, he's put together a list of the frequently asked questions, and uh, we're just going to go through them here, and hopefully uh, he'll answer your question. If not, feel free to, to log into livefaq.com and ask your own question, and we'll get to it either during this session or at a follow-up session. So let's get started. So the first question is, um, I know cardiologists take care of people who have heart attacks. Um, what else do cardiologists specialize in? That, you know, I think that's a great question because, like you said, I think a lot of focus has been placed on the fact that doctors, uh, cardiologists take care of people who have had heart attacks. But in fact, what cardiologists do is much broader than that and it is an important thing for people to understand that if they have problems in other areas that a cardiologist might be a good person for them to get in touch with. So as you said, um, we take care of people who have had heart attacks, that's very common, but we're also trained to take care of the changes that sometimes take place in the valves within the heart muscle that allow the blood to flow from one chamber of the heart to the other. Remember that the, the heart not only pumps blood to your muscles and to all of your body, but it also pumps blood back to your lungs so that you can get oxygen back into your blood so that your muscles will have the fuel that they need to do whatever it is that you're doing. Cardiologists also deal with the electrical activity in the heart, which is part of what causes the heart to beat in a coordinated and efficient way. And there are things that change in that electrical activity that can uh, interrupt um, how the heart works effectively. And, and lastly, and that's part of the heart attack thing, because of the effect of cholesterol and lipids on the ease with which blood flows, not only to feed the heart muscle with its nutrients, but there are also changes that take place in other blood vessels in other parts of the body, like the brain, which is why people have strokes, and in your legs or in your arms and your extremities that may interrupt your ability to be active in your life. So um, those are the general areas that cardiologists are trained to um, be helpful to people about. Wow. Um, the next question is, uh, can I have a heart attack if I or can I have heart disease? That is the question. If I still feel okay? You know, that is a question that we um, get asked all of the time. And in certain instances, people will actually come into us and um, think that they're fine and want to understand what they can do to continue what they perceive as their health. And in some instances, we have to give them the information that, you know, they've had what we call silent heart attacks. And that means that there has been an interruption in the blood flow to your heart muscle, which decreases its ability to pump your blood um, effectively. And um, there's been nothing that you have noticed about that. Now, that's not the most common event, but it can certainly happen. Um, it happens more frequently in people that may have a family history of heart problems. Um, and that's usually most commonly defined by people that may have had family members, brothers, sisters, mothers, um, grandparents that may have become aware that they had problems with their heart before they were 40 years old. Um, you know, if you have heart disease when you're 70, as we'll talk about as we go further, there are lots of things that can contribute to that. But people that have problems with their heart before they're 40 usually have some kind of a genetic predisposition to uh, to have these kind of problems. Right. Well, we've all heard about the you know the chest pains and the si the signals of 
uh, having a heart attack. Is it possible or can I have a heart attack without chest pain? Yes. Um, there are lots of indications that um, you might be having a problem with your heart. Chest pain, fortunately, is the most common because that's the thing that most people are aware of. So if they get chest pain, they frequently know that they may be experiencing a heart attack and they'll call 911 or let somebody know, a co-worker or a family member, that they need some help. But sometimes just having an ache in your arm, um, persistent, generally more than just something that you might have if you've been active in the garden um, over the weekend or playing sports. Um, sometimes discomfort going up into your neck and into your jaw can be an indication that you might be experiencing um, a heart attack. And some people just get a tummy ache. Um, so what I tell my patients is that if something changes about how you feel, which is different from what you're used to experiencing, um, and either it continues for a while or it seems to be something that's just really a departure from how you feel, you should probably get somebody to look into it for you. So um, are, I know that there are uh, different tests that, that uh, we all can take to, you know, to, to know what our risks are. Are there any, in, in, your, in your experience, must-have tests to check for heart disease? You know, I think that um, for people that have what we refer to as risk factors for heart disease, and those would be a family history, um, if they know that their lipids are out of, you know, out of whack, um, if they know that they may be overweight, um, if they have diabetes or a family history of diabetes, um, if they smoke, um, those are people that should really get checked. And the first place to start is to go and talk to your family doctor, um, talk to either he or she about how you're feeling, you know, what may have changed, um, and probably the first thing that they'll do is they'll do some blood tests to check your cholesterol level and your triglycerides and your other blood lipids. They may do an electrocardiogram, which is a way to see if somebody may have had a heart attack that they didn't know about. Um, and then there are other tests that, depending upon the results of those tests, may follow on that will help to determine whether or not you are at risk for something like this. So you mentioned cholesterol and lipids. Uh, what's the difference between those two? Well, when we talk about cholesterol and lipids, we really are talking about four or five different components of what we call a lipid panel. So there is you know, good cholesterol, which is the cholesterol, that we call that HDL cholesterol, high density lipoprotein. Um, and that is the part of the cholesterol that generally increases with exercise and activity. Um, there is what we call LDL, or low-density lipoproteins, and those are the ones that are the most worrisome. And then there are triglycerides, which are other fats that are in the blood, which are not as directly associated with the potential to have a heart attack as the LDL cholesterol. That's the one that, um, if there is an abnormality there, is the most worrisome. And what is done when you have your lipids checked is that the lab runs a ratio of your high-density lipoproteins, the good cholesterol, to the bad cholesterol. And depending upon what that ratio looks like, it gives your doctor an indication of what your risk factors might be. So now, how does high cholesterol affect my body? Well, high cholesterol, the good cholesterol, cholesterol is, in addition to um, being part of the problem for people that develop heart disease, cholesterol is a chemical that is part of building other chemicals and hormones in your body, which help your body function properly. 
So having you know normal levels of cholesterol um, is a good thing, and you want to make sure that you've got the building blocks of the things that are necessary to have other parts of your body develop those chemicals and mediators that um, are necessary for your body to work properly. So, uh, so all that uh, talk about eggs, <laughs> we probably should, it's based upon your individual needs, right? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, cholesterol, you get cholesterol in your body from basically two different ways. Your liver produces it, and the amount that your liver produces, and again, that's part of providing other parts of your body with the building blocks that they need. Um, so your liver produces cholesterol, and then obviously, like you said, with eggs and other things that we all love to eat, um, you know, we ingest cholesterol and our body absorbs that. Um, and so if you are a person that is at risk for having heart disease and your liver is producing a normal or even a slightly increased amount of cholesterol, which depends upon your genetic makeup, um, then if you eat a lot of cholesterol containing foods then you're going to end up having a total cholesterol which is higher than might be what you really want. So you need to know how much your body is producing, um, how much you're eating, um, and then obviously if you have an elevation you're going to need to do the first thing which you, everybody knows about which is to begin to cut back on eggs and bacon and all that delicious food. Ah, yes. Well, the good thing is, is you can actually test the, your cholesterol numbers fairly easily and we'll, I'll uh, leave a link to how you can do that in the comment section of this, of this tape or you can uh, ask a question and we'll get it answered. So the next question is, what is an MRI, an NMR lipid panel and who should get one? Um, an NMR lipid panel is a relatively new test, a panel. Um, it's been around probably for three, maybe as many as five years. It's not commonly utilized. Um, many general practitioners and family doctors are not particularly familiar with it. Uh, in fact, many cardiologists are not that familiar with it, but many are. Um, and it's becoming something that more and more doctors are um, educating themselves about. And the NMR part stands for nuclear magnetic resonance, um, which is what takes place when you have an MRI. Lots of people are familiar with MRIs. Um, you know, athletes have them if they get injured to sort of give their doctors an indication of what the nature of their problem is. That's probably the most common use of that. And the NMR test for cholesterol means that the blood specimen that is provided is exposed to those same magnetic factors um, that muscles or joints are um, exposed to when um, either athletes or the everyday weekend warrior gets hurt. Um, and that allows for the results of the cholesterol test to be broken down into many, many more components than just the few that we talked about um, a couple of minutes ago. And so you end up with many, many different um, markers, one of which um, is the one that cardiologists and family doctors are most concerned about and really give them an indication of those individuals that um, really need to um, address their, their cholesterol issues. And you can have a dangerously high um, NMR lipid um, abnormality even if you have normal cholesterol values. And so for people that, like we talked about a little while ago, either have a family history of heart disease or who have other risk factors, um, it's probably a good idea um, these days to have an NMR um, uh, lipid panel done because it's going to give your doctor very, very valuable information. Wow, that's great. So the next question is, 
then how often should I have my cholesterol checked, or should I should I check my cholesterol level? Well, the answer to that really depends upon what your risk factors are, what your family history is, and whether or not when you have your cholesterol value checked the first time, whether or not there are any abnormalities. So it's a little bit of a complicated answer. I'm going to try and not make it too complicated. If you have very few or no risk factors and you check your cholesterol and your values are normal, you probably ought to have that test repeated every couple of years, two, three years. Um, if something changes and your risk factors increase, then that number of years in between the tests should probably become short. Um, so if you stop exercising or if you gain weight or if you develop diabetes or, you know, heaven forbid you make the bad choice to start smoking, then waiting two or three years would probably not be the best choice. Um, if your cholesterol value is abnormal and you are determined to have some risk factors, then depending upon what you've decided to do to address those risk factors, you should have your cholesterol checked every six months, maybe every year. Um, but that's a good conversation to have with your doctor. Right. So um, what are the drugs that are used to cre create, uh, to create, to treat <laughs> cholesterol? And then are there uh, any side effects to those drugs? Well, there are um, the major classification of drugs that are used now to treat um, people that have an elevated cholesterol are called statin drugs. Um, and there are statin drugs and then there are combination statin drugs where there is more than one statin combined with another statin and that can sometimes be more effective. There are also drugs like niacin and other drugs that can be added to the statins which will lower the reabsorption of your cholesterol. So if you are continuing to eat foods that have cholesterol in them, it's pretty hard to avoid cholesterol all together. But there are drugs that basically can reduce your body's reabsorption of cholesterol from the foods that you eat in addition to reducing your um, liver's production of cholesterol. So like I said, it falls into those two general categories. So um, if I do have to take drugs like, uh, like statins, is there a good time of day to take them? Um, what most um, cardiologists advise their patients to do, um, and again, it depends on what other medications they're on and whether or not um, they might be having um, any side effects. But what I tell my patients is to take their statins at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason that I tell them that is that the amount of time that each pill stays in your system is about 24 hours. Um, and so breakfast, if people are eating breakfast, um, and that tends to be a time when um, cholesterol-containing foods um, uh, are a common part of breakfast foods, um, by the time you begin to absorb um, the foods that you ate for breakfast, the medication is still on, um, is still in your system from the day before. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because if you take it first thing in the morning, then the dose from the day before is all gone because it's all used, it's all used up in, in 24 hours. And then if you take it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, when you eat dinner, which is another time that cholesterol-containing foods are a common part of what a lot of people eat, you know, meat, um, you know, uh, beef or, or other things, um, then you've got the medication in your system to help you then. Um, and because some people get an upset tummy with um, these medications, um, if you take them after you've eaten your midday meal, um, so you've got some food in your stomach, um, it reduces the amount of um, upset that it causes. So what you're doing is you're taking it at a time when you maximize its ability to give you the kind of protection that you need and you reduce the potential for side effects. So now if if I take statins or if I'm if I'm taking them, is that something that I'll have to take for the rest of my life? Well, 
I get asked that question all of the time. And I think that it's another one of those it depends answers. Um, if you are somebody that has enjoyed um, a lot of cholesterol containing foods um, and are willing to make the lifestyle adjustments to reduce or eliminate those foods and your you know you're eating those foods has contributed to the fact that your cholesterol numbers are high then after you've made that lifestyle adjustment you may find that your cholesterol values fall back to normal um, and if you can continue to um, keep those changes as part of your life then you may very well be able to avoid and eliminate having to take medications and so with my patients um, I talk to them about what they're willing to do. Some people tell me, you know, no way, I'm not eating bacon. And I go, well, then you better get used to taking a pill every day at 2 o'clock. But, you know, if you can either moderate it or eliminate it, then it's a trade-off. Um, so the answer is lifestyle changes in many instances can eliminate the need to take medication. And that's, you know, that's a really wonderful thing. Well, I think that leads us right into the, the next question is, if my cholesterol levels are elevated, uh, will I have to take a drug or are there other choices instead of the drug? Right. Well, like we just talked about, um, one of the choices is obviously to reduce or eliminate those foods that can um, increase your cholesterol. The other thing that, you know, every doctor is going to tell every patient that smokes is you have to stop smoking. Very, very important. And for those young people that haven't started smoking yet, they should not start because it's really hard to stop. Um, for people who are overweight, um, optimizing their weight by either increasing their activity or reducing the number of calories that they eat every day is very important. Um, and then, you know, getting some exercise. And people don't have to be marathon runners or triathletes. Um, getting out and walking, um, you know, for 20 or 30 minutes um, a day, and it doesn't have to be every day, five days a week. Um, walking briskly, you can't just be, you know, goofing around. You've got to basically walk. Um, it's a great opportunity to get a pet, get a dog. Dog likes to go walk with you, you know. Bond with your dog and get out and, 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 and get some exercise. All of those things really give people the opportunity by having a healthy lifestyle to um, reduce their risk of you know, getting um, either having a heart attack or having a stroke or getting blockages in their extremities so that they can't do the kinds of things that they want and eliminate the, needs to, the need to take, uh, to take medication. Well, and here in Oklahoma, we also have the option of uh, bison bacon. So I hear that's pretty low in cholesterol. <laughs> so, um, oh, the next question is, uh, I've heard of stress tests. Uh, can you describe or explain what is a stress test? Um, well, my stress test around here is, uh, is asking my teenage daughters how their day went. <laughs> Um, but for most people, um, if you have had um, some things going on in your body which have caused your doctor to think that you might have heart disease, one of what we call screening tests is for people to walk on a treadmill. Um, most everybody knows what a treadmill is, but it's basically a motorized walkway. Um, you're connected to an electrocardiograph to see if there are any changes in the electrical um, activity in your heart. Um, and then um, either your primary care doctor, if they've been trained to do it, or if they refer you to a cardiologist, will gradually increase the pace at which you walk, um, increase the elevation to get your heart rate up to the target heart rate. Um, and then sometimes these tests, um, in addition to having the um, monitoring of the electrocardiogram, which will change and give a specific, the change in the pattern will then inform the doctor doing the test as to whether or not the test is indicating that you may have heart disease. 
but there are two other things that um, sometimes uh, doctors do in addition to just collecting um, electrocardiographic information. Uh, sometimes they do what's called um, an echocardiographic stress test, which means that they bounce sound waves off of your heart and they can see whether or not as you increase your activity, the um, pumping activity of your heart changes. And then there's another kind of a stress test which is called a thallium stress test, which is a chemical that um, is injected through an intravenous, which is started before your test. And once you get to your targeted heart rate, they um, do a scan of your heart. You lie under a, a machine that sort of looks like an x-ray machine, and they can look at whether or not the thallium, how it is, um, whether it's uniformly distributed through your heart muscle. Um, if it's not uniformly distributed, what that means is that there may be um, some blood vessels going to a part of your heart where the thallium didn't get to that may have some obstructions in them. So those are different variations of stress tests, but the most common one is just to connect somebody to an electrocardiogram and have them walk until they get their heart rate to their target and see whether or not there are any changes. Wow. So, okay, here's the, the, you know, the big question I'm sure uh, all of your patients probably ask, and it's probably a very popular one. If I've had a heart attack or I have a heart attack, uh, can I have sex again? Um, I think that the answer to that is that in most instances the answer is yes. Um, it depends on the severity of the blockages in the blood vessels that feed the heart muscle. Um, but in many instances there are um, procedures that can be done, bypass procedures, most people know about that, if, if the blockages are um, such that that is a recommended procedure. There are things, there's a procedure called an angioplasty where the blockages can be moved out of the way. And then in many instances, um, with the lifestyle changes that we've been talking about and the exercise, people can actually reverse the blockages in their in the blood vessels that feed their, their heart with the oxygen that it needs. Um, so that, you know, with time and with these kinds of changes and with medications, um, people can go back to having a very normal um, amount of sexual activity in their life. Good. So a, a lot of people in, within a certain age group are having to deal with not only their own health, but that of their children and of their parents. The next question I think addresses that, and it's, if my lipids are elevated, should I check the rest of my family? And, you know, at what age do I check my kids, and then should uh, my parents then be checked? Well, I think that um, I believe that getting baseline information is really a, a great idea, because even if their baseline information is normal, which is what we would all hope for, um, if it changes as we get older or as we become less active or you know, eat different foods and we have to recheck those blood tests that we did when we were younger, we have a point of comparison. So I'm a believer in know your numbers. I think that um, getting those blood tests checked at an early age can be very important. Um, there is, you know, there is somebody that um, I have talked to who is a young, healthy woman. Um, I think she's 24. She may be 27. Um, she exercises. She doesn't smoke. Um, and um, she decided to check her numbers. Um, and it turned out that, um, as a surprise to everybody, her cholesterol values were very abnormal. Um, no real indication that she should have expected that she would have had any problems. The good news for this young lady is that now that she knows that um, she's got this problem, she can begin to do things that um, can help fix her numbers. Um, she can again reduce the cholesterol containing foods. 
Um, you know, she may decide that you know having an egg or two every morning is something she can go without. Um, she may want to get a little bit more um, exercise. So these tests are not expensive. Um, most people who have health insurance um, can get these tests provided by their health insurance company. Um, and the good news is that if they're normal, then you know that um, you know you can wait, like we talked about, you know, two, three, five years before you get them checked again. Um, and for people that have a family history of having elevations in those blood tests, it's a really good idea. But I recommend it to everybody. I think it's a great idea. Wonderful. So, uh, and then we'll also um, you can go to steponehealth.com. Uh, Dr. Bramman mentioned if you have insurance. Uh, there's a great way to uh, have your insurance cover the cost of a really standard, uh, standardized uh, test and uh, to get your levels checked right now. So I've, I'll add the link to that in the description here. So we talked a lot about foods to avoid to control cholesterol and cholesterol-containing foods. Are there foods to avoid after having a heart attack? Um. The answer to that is the same food that you might um, have had to make some choices about before you had a heart attack. Again, you want to decrease the factors that are going on in your body which are going to contribute to blockages in the blood vessels that feed your brain, your legs, um, and your heart muscle. Um, you know, once you begin to have these blockages, what happens is there is a reduction in the smooth flow of the blood as it goes past these blockages. And so you get, sort of think about a river where, that you throw a rock in. So instead of the water flowing really smoothly and looking like glass, you begin to get waves and you know, you know, disruptions. You get white water around, around the rock. Well, that interruption in the smooth flow of blood in your blood vessels then causes there to be more of these blockages laid down and it breaks down the smooth lining of those blood vessels which is what can cause people to have further blockages and an interruption of the blood flow altogether which is what causes a stroke or a heart attack. So we talked about weight loss for those of us who have extra poundage. If uh, if I lose the weight, will that be enough to keep me from having a heart attack? It will certainly be a great help. It will depend on what other risk factors you have. So, you know, if you smoke and you lose weight, you still are at risk for having a heart attack. Smoking is, you know, smoking is probably the number one risk factor besides your genetics. Right. Um, I think that if you're not a smoker and you reduce your weight um, and you make whatever adjustments in the foods that you eat, if your cholesterol is elevated, um, you've gone a long way to control your risk factors and you're going to reduce the chances that you're going to have a heart attack. That's awesome. So uh, we've talked about food, we've talked about diet and weight loss. Uh, what about beer and wine? Can I can I drink beer and wine after a heart attack? Yes, I think that um, again, um, it's like anything else, and everybody's going to hear the same thing that they've heard from their parents and from their doctors. It's all of these things can be um, enjoyed in moderation. So um, you know, a a glass of wine medium-sized glass of wine with your dinner a couple of times a week is certainly fine. The same thing is true for, you know, a beer or maybe when you're watching, you know, a sports event if that's a time that you might enjoy having a beer, but, you know, in moderation. So certainly not more than one um, at a time and certainly not every day. Um, and um, if you know, you notice that your weight's beginning to go back up because there are lots of calories in those beverages, right. then that's just another choice that you have to make. <laughs> right. So we talked about uh, exercise as well, and you talked about walking, but do you have to do strenuous exercise in order to get 
the benefits? Um, you know, that's the really good news. You really don't. Um, you know, like we talked about a, a, a few minutes ago, going out and walking with your dog or, you know, just walking with your partner, um, you know, is good. You have to walk with, you know, some, you know, sense of commitment. Um, and what I tell people is that um, they shouldn't be out of breath. They shouldn't be uncomfortable. Um, when they first start, they're not going to be able to walk as fast as they will after they've been walking for a while. So it's sort of like you know getting in shape when we were younger. Um, you know, for those of uh, us that you know played sports um, and we had to get in shape, the beginning of the season was always a lot tougher than the end of the season. Um, so once you start, you should sort of walk to the point where you know you're comfortable. People should not be gasping for breath. That's not a good idea and that's not necessary. Um, and if they walk deliberately then they will find that after they've done it for four to six weeks they can walk further and walk faster than they did when they first started which is a nice way of feeling like you're really getting something done. That's great. I love I love walking and I have three dogs to uh, to, to at least encourage me to get out more. <laughs> so uh, we're almost at our last question, and I think this kind of ties into what we've been talking about from a weight loss and just how, how our lives are today. And, and it's the subject of diabetes. Is diabetes associated with high cholesterol? Um, diabetes by itself is not associated with high cholesterol people with diabetes can have normal cholesterol values. Diabetes is the body's inability to process sugar um, and uh, have it digested properly and eliminated from, from your blood. Um, you know, sugar is um, something that can contribute to triglycerides, but as we talked about earlier, Triglycerides in and of themselves are not necessarily one of the major risk factors for heart disease. Um, but people with diabetes also have a predisposition to developing blockages in their blood vessels um, because of the change in the way the lining of their blood vessels works. And so it's important for people with diabetes to make sure that they don't add the additional risk factor of having an elevated cholesterol as part of their dealing with their diabetes issues. So most doctors with their diabetic patients will check their cholesterol values and will make whatever um, recommendations they need to make um, depending upon what those uh, tests show. Well, I think we've come to the end of uh, the current list of questions and I really want to thank you uh, Dr. Bramer for joining us and uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Bramer, please feel free to uh, log on to livefaq.com and uh, you'll see the section to ask Dr. Bramer. hopefully you'll see his picture there and uh, you'll be able to ask him a question and uh, or you can tweet at step one health or use the live FAQ hashtag and uh, we'll get your question answered next time. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Grant Brandman. It was my pleasure, Cheryl. Thanks so much for having me. Okay.